family, welcome. This is the day the Lord has made and we Yay. will rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Lerato. And my name is Nicole. And we are so glad you've decided to join us today. We've got some amazing things coming up. Yeah. Um, we're going to be listening to a message about bringing hope in people's lives and the hope that God really is. And we've also got some cool stories coming up. Please stay tuned for that. Get comfortable, you know, and we will see you in a bit. I've got in another special guest with me here today. Your name is? Raymond. <laughs> nice to meet you, Raymond. I hear it's your first time here at Urban yeah, Life. My first time today, yes. How did you find out about Urban Life? Well, I actually came for a different reason, but uh, we're not going to go into too much detail. It might take a bit of time, but uh, the guy at the gate was very friendly, so he said to me, I must come in. I really enjoyed the service. I think it hit, hit hard certain places. It's a really difficult time in my life. Yeah. Like I say, I was actually coming to church today to ask around to find work for truck drivers. So it's, yeah. things are difficult at the moment. And, you know, yeah, it hit home, and they, they sent me to the front to put the light in the... Yeah, on the life sign there and yeah. I, yeah, that made me cry actually. So oh. It was actually like he was preaching exactly to me because everything that he said was what's happening in my life at the moment. It's just difficult and yeah. you know, being 46 years old is not exactly where I was planning on being. Yeah. But that's just where I am and, and yeah. And coming here today, yeah, it's definitely been a great experience. So we've got my lady with us. Uh, what stood out for me during the service was putting your hope in the Lord and not in the outcome of your circumstances. I've been thinking a lot about depression and how the core of it is hopelessness. Just knowing that um, he's not a liar. like. Yeah. He's not a liar, he will keep his promises. There used to be a time where I actually struggled with depression. Um, and I remember I tried committing suicide. And when the Lord delivered me from it, I kept like learning a lot about just hope and clinging onto that. So I think, like I said, this is a good reminder because I was finding myself <sighs> slipping away in my hope. <laughs> so like I said, like just when your hope is in the Lord, when your focus is in the Lord, like there's no amount of circumstance that will like discourage you or take you back to what the Lord can deliver you out of yeah seats and as you do that give your friend a big high five crisp one tell them they look beautiful if it is true now nah, I'm kidding you all look beautiful it's a good day to be at church today it's a significant Sunday to be at church Danny why are you pulling my things let's give a big shout out to Danny for being helpful <laughs> Um, it's quite a significant Sunday, this Sunday, uh, because next week, Sunday, when we come here, we'll have, depending on how quick they count, we'll have a pretty good clear of who's going to lead our nation to the next season. So I don't know how that makes you feel. <laughs> Uh, does it get you like, yeah, like we're going to know, or there's a little bit of anxiety that comes through with that statement. But then I, I want to say, as we go into, uh, what do you call it, into the polling, into the voting stations, so I know that there's a few people in the room, uh, some of you are voting, so you are really hoping that your uh, political party that you support wins. Some of you are not voting because you forgot to register, so I encourage you to make sure you do that next time we go to vote. But if you didn't, there's no pressure. Well, there is pressure, but there is no condemnation. We still love you. We still accept you. Um, and there are some of you that are not from South Africa, so you would like to vote because you've got a stake in this nation, but you actually can't. So you're just like, oh, I really hope that something turns out right in this election. And most of you are awkward right now because I'm talking about political parties. And then you still stay silent, which makes me know that you're even more awkward that I'm talking about elections. Like, are we supposed to talk politics in church? 
But uh, the encouragement I have for you, regardless of where you are at uh, in this, is that, man, let's go there with hope, with faith, not in what the circumstances hold, but in our Christ, in our Lord and our Savior. That's what makes us such a beautiful people as the church, is that our hope is not on the things of this world or leaders of this world, but our hope is in Christ. And we get to participate, but we don't anchor our hope there. Is that cool? Yeah. Awesome. I'm encouraging myself to do the same as well. So, how many of you know what this is. How many of you are familiar with this little thing I have in my hand? Uh, do you guys know what this is? Does anyone not know what this is? Uh, well, not everybody's agreeing. How many of you, do you all know what this is? Someone at the back is like, what is he holding? I have never seen that device. It's a cell phone? It's just so you know. Okay, let's try again with a different, with a different thing. How many of you know what this is? Ah. Guys, I chose the simplest thing so that all of you can be like, yeah, that's keys. How many of you know what this is? How many of you have seen this before? Yeah. All righty. Okay, okay. Now you've joined the WhatsApp group. Hopefully the last one will be a bit. Um, and this? It's, a, it's quite tiny. I don't know where the light is. Do you know what this is? It's a wallet. Okay, you got it? Okay, what do all these things have in common? They came. <laughs> That's a good one. I don't have money in my pocket, though. So, uh, what do all these things, other than coming out of my pocket, have in common for you? Huh? They can all fit in your pocket. You probably really need them most of the t all the time. Like these are like the m some of the most important things. You need a, your keys for your car or for the house that you live in, or you're gonna sleep outside. You need your wallet or. It's shy if you can't pay for whatever you want to get. I mean, your cell phone, it's quite important, right? For me, what they have in common is that I lose all these things all the time. Like, I'm genuinely always looking for where my keys are or where my cell phone is or where my wallet is. I actually have a saying here at Ever Life that I invented that everybody on staff is hired to find my stuff. So, uh, do your job well, Danny. <laughs> find my things. But... Literally, out of nowhere, Lauren will come to me or somebody will be like, Wanga, here's your card again. And there's a certain uh, pressure or a certain groan that I have every single time I realize that I've lost one of these. For example, when I get home, uh, actually this happened quite recently. I, I, I got to my house after I went out with friends and then I get to the door and then I go, ah. Wanga, not again. Where did you leave your keys? I'm calling my friend, and he's like, no, bruh, I don't have your keys. I don't know where your keys are. Like, it's a constant thing. And then this guy here, I feel like he's constantly ghosting me. Like, it's a real ghosting me, phone, laugh. Ah, <laughs> it's a joke. It's funny to me. <laughs> um, but even my phone... Uh, actually, this is not my wallet. This is uh, a friend of mine's wallet. So uh, he's got, uh, I know what is in here and how. He's got his nice checkers card and his bank card. But for me, so a while ago, like what, a few weeks ago, I went away uh, for holiday and I have two cards with me, bank cards. And I took both of them with me, which was mistake number one, given that I lose all my things all the time. So I take both of them with me. And then when I came back, I had zero card. Now, the thing with losing your card, especially if you're a young guy, single like me, is that when you go out with your mates and then you arrive to a restaurant or you arrive somewhere and then you start doing, ah, guys, ish, who's paying for me today? Who's volunteering? You're like, but I have money, I promise. Like, I didn't plan to like, ah, and it's like this, there's like a groaning of shame that is just underneath. And you're like, God, take me away from this situation. And then you thought you have so much money in your account, so you went all out and you're looking at the bill, you're like, all my single friends can't afford this bill, so they all have to come together and pay for it or something. But there is a serious groaning where that comes when we've misplaced our items, and if you're like me or anything like me, you can relate to what it's like to misplace something 
that is valuable to you. Am I right? Yeah. But what I, I know as well is that that losing mis or misplacing items or the groaning that comes with misplacing items is just the tip of the iceberg for the groaning that's underneath. There's a groaning that I believe we all share right now at this moment, at this time of our lives that is so deep within that actually I can joke about keys and all of that, but we can all feel it. We all understand it. We all know it. It's the groaning that you have when you look at the economy and you look at everything that's going on and it feels like it's just throwing curveballs all the time. As you look ahead to the elections, there's a groaning. You're like, if that party wins, and you're like, oh, if this party wins, and you're like, oh, you don't know what's going to happen. There's a deep groaning in society that we can all feel. It's a groaning in our relationships, in our families, in, in, in not knowing what the future holds or what is going to happen. And it feels like we can all see it and we can all feel it all around us, whether you believe in Jesus or whether you don't, you know that the groaning is real. I think of my friends and the people that I do life with. I currently, right now, in this moment, I have a friend who's in the hospital with his baby girl. And it's been a week of them there with tests and tests and an operation. And I go, God, I don't know what he's feeling. What is that groaning that he has right now with where he's at? And by the way, that friend is Warren. So Warren, if you are watching right now, I want you to let you, I let you know that we are praying for you and your family and we're trusting that your baby girl will come home soon. But we know it and we all feel it. There is a deep groaning. I have a friend who's a soccer player, a really good one. Like, he's amazing. And he's also an amazing human being as well, which I love about him. But he came from playing for Bafana Bafana for South Africa into not playing at the moment. And I, I can imagine him with the future that he's going into. What is the groaning that he's facing? He had a conversation with another friend of mine whose mom was in the hospital for all these things that they had to do. And she, he met with her and she was just afraid and scared and going, I don't know what's going to happen to me. Am I going to stay in this medication for the rest of my life? This is not how I want to die. This is not how I want things to turn out. And I go, I feel your pain. I feel your groaning. But even I can never come to a place where I can comprehend. You think of yourself, maybe it's a job, and you had a job that was going well and paying bills, and you couldn't have foreseen that just like that, you'd be one of the people that let go. Maybe you are juggling a business, and you thought this was the year where it was all going to work out, and you were all going to get it right, but there's a groaning when you realize that it's not going as you thought it would go. Do you feel it? We all have it in some way, in one way or another. But I want to encourage you today. I want to let you know that even in the groaning, what I love about the Bible and the Word of God is that the Bible knows it and the Bible understands it. And I don't know if that's enough motivation, but we're going to get to more just now. But that enough should help you stay in a place where you're like, okay, God, I, I don't know if I can have it all figured out, but I'm glad that you know that you understand. We're going to read from Romans in a moment. But I want to give you a picture of what is going on in this Roman scripture that we're getting to read this morning. Uh, Romans, at that time, it wasn't the Rome that we know now. So this letter was written to the Roman church, but it wasn't the Rome that we know now that is filled with Catholic and there's Christians everywhere. In fact, at that time, Christianity was one of the smallest religions that were really just starting to come out and come up. Uh, Rome was a place where it was filled with chaos and Christians were actually being persecuted just everywhere. But beyond that, there was just a political mess that was going around just because of the ruler and the emperor that was there at the time. So they are looking at the economy and they're going, well, this is a mess. They are looking at their circumstances as believers and they're going, this is a mess. So there is a groaning in them. And then Paul writes this letter as an encouragement. And what you will see is that Paul gets to the root of things, but he also gives them encouragement by not ignoring where they are at, but by giving them hope in the situation that they find themselves in. He understands them. And the craziest thing about the Romans, the Roman church in this time is that there was a Jewish church and there was also a Christian church. So not only was the world divided, but the church was also divided. 
Because the Jewish people want to do things this way. The Gentile people want to do things this way. And Paul will cut through, right through this mess to hopefully give you hope where you are at right now. Are you ready? Are we alive? Awesome. Let's read Romans 8. You're going to read from verse 18 to 23. So you can find it in your scripture or your Bible or your phone. Here's what it says, or you can read behind me. Yet, what we suffer now, come on, immediately, he understands right there where they are at. What we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation, say all creation, creation. is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. You see, what Paul does here is saying, Oh, no, what you think is unique to you, what you think you are going through alone, I can promise you all creation is feeling what you are going through as well. We are all in this together. For all creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subject to God's curse, but with eager hope, say eager hope. The creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only is all creation at the moment groaning, but what Paul is going to do is ground us in reality and say, no, it's not just unique to this time, but it's never been unique. Actually, from the beginning of time till now and to the future until we see Jesus once again, this will be our reality. So he's not ignoring where they are at, but he's still calling them to something more. For we know that all creation has been growing as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan. Come on, he's saying, well, not only is the world groaning, which is true, even us believers are feeling that, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we know For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God gives us full rights as his adopted children, including, excuse me, my note skipped. Okay, I'll read it at the back. We too wait with eager hope. (laughs) We were given this hope when we were saved. We can end there for now. But we were given this hope When we were saved. Okay, so what is Paul talking about here? What is going on? So I have Andy uh, called me yesterday after reading my notes, and she's like, Wanga, I think you should change your title. I'm like, Andy, okay, let me go with this. So my title was going to be A Better Way to Groan. Like, and I was going to get all of us to go, oh, ha, okay, this is the better one. And he's like, no, no one wants that, Wanga. Just don't do that. Let me give you a better title. But in order to help me with that, she said, do you know that the word that is being used there for groaning is actually being, is a reference to when a mother or a lady gives birth to a child. So what will happen? Okay, I wouldn't know this if you didn't tell me, okay? What will happen as a parent gives birth? She will groan. But it's not a groan of mourning or like crying, but it's a groan with an eager expectation. She knows that she's feeling pain, but she's using that as a way to cope. It's a coping groan because she's coping knowing that something is going to come out. There is something on the other side. There's a groaning that is fueled with hope. So I titled my message, A Better Way. A better way to cope. Because I think all of us right now, where we are at, we are looking for a better way to cope. We are feeling overwhelmed. We are going through all of these things and we are groaning through them. But I really believe that God wants to give us a better way to cope. A better way to cope with the circumstances that we are going through. A better way to cope with the pain that you might be going through. A better way to cope in your families and where you might be. And I feel it too. In fact, this week I was struggling. I'm like, God, I can't cope with all of these things that are happening in my life. And I'm so grateful that hope is the better way to cope. But what hope? What hope? Is it uh, the hope that my favorite team wins? And United fans in the house... 
They finally came to church after a very, very, very long time. So when United wins, they sing glory, glory, men United. <laughs> but we know it's not that, it's more than just, it's, just, it's not just optimism. Is it a hope that you get the job, you get the car, or you get the girl? Oh, I put that in there because of you guys, the front seat. Is it a hope that my political party wins? No, it's not that. It's a much better hope. And I want to say to you, there is a better way, and it's through hope. It's a hope that is not just focused on my preferences or my circumstances. In fact, the word hope in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament, is used in two ways. Uh, one, to describe waiting, and two, uh, well, they're both waiting. So it means to wait or to wait for. But it's, a, it's not just uh, I'm waiting for something to happen, but it's directly linked every single time to the person of Jesus or the person of who God is, to his nature and his character. I'm not just waiting for something to happen. It's connected to the nature and character of God. That is the hope that God is calling us to, to wait on the Lord, to wait for God, to wait in knowing what God has done before. It's looking backwards while we look ahead. Are we looking backwards in our circumstances? No, we are looking backwards in what God has done. It's a waiting, excuse me, it's a waiting in knowing the nature and character of God. So I want to ask you right now, how are you coping? How are you coping? Are you coping with hope? Are you coping in despair? Are you looking at your situation and where you are at and going, God has done it before, he can do it again. Are you going through his word and seeing the promises that he has given you and the words that he has spoken to you and you use that as the anchor for your hope or are you looking at your circumstances and you are filled with fear and anxiety and despair? The hope that God is calling us to is a hope that is anchored in him alone. You see, we all know that circumstances change. We all know that one of us or a lot of us will be disappointed next week because we are not all voting for the same party. So not all of us will be satisfied by the results of what happens next week. But what we do know is that there is one who doesn't change. And his name is Jesus. He's the same yesterday, he's the same today, and he'll be the same forevermore. So are we going to put our faith and our hope in something that's temporal, or are we going to put our faith and our hope in the one who is unchanging? So this week, one of the things I felt, I just felt like hope was leaving. I felt like hope was slipping away from me. I was like even lying in my bed and thinking of all these things that are happening around me. I'm like, oh God, it's so much. Uh, and then I felt God say, hope is where you left it. In fact, you can take your wallet back before I lose it. Your wallet is where you left it with me, okay? There you go. But hope, I felt God say, hope is where you left it. Here's, here's the thing. I can almost guarantee you 100% of the time, when I lose my keys, when I lose my cell phone, when I lose my wallet, they are where I left them. Yeah. I might not know where I left them, but they are there where we left them. And it's the same thing with hope. It's where you left it. Where did you leave it? In the nature and character of God. That's where hope is. This is why what Paul says here is so powerful. We were given this hope when we were saved. So hope is not something that we strive for to get. Hope is not something we try hard to achieve. Hope is something we get when we come into a relationship with Jesus. We get given that hope freely. So when I feel like hope is slipping away from me, the chances are that I have neglected the person of Jesus. Because when I'm in a place where I'm continuously walking my journey with Jesus and returning to him as my first love, as my anchor, I will always be filled with hope because hope is with a person, not in a thing or in a circumstance. circumstance. His name is Jesus. So I want to ask you, how are you coping? Are you going to Jesus for coping? Are you going to him or are you looking at your circumstances? There's a better way to cope and it's going to the person of Jesus. 
It's going back to your first love. Salvation is not a destination. It's a journey. We walk it out every single day. We go to him. I'm anxious, Jesus. I'm stressed about my job. I'm stressed about my family. I feel hope slipping away, but I know you gave me this hope. So will you give it to me more and more and more? Because hope is a person, and his name is? That's where our hope is, and that's how we cope, by finding hope. Where? Where we left it in the person and the nature and the character of Jesus. Romans 15 verse 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him. May the God of hope, I'll read it again, may the God of hope. Did you know that God is a God of hope? He's a God of hope and he wants to fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him. So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let me ask you another question. Is your life overflowing with hope? Is my life overflowing with hope? Because this is the promise that the God of hope will fill us with joy and peace and we will overflow with hope as we walk with the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I feel like my life is not overflowing with hope a lot of times. But here's a beautiful thing. Not only do we find hope, but we can actually walk in hope. We can walk the journey of constantly overflowing with hope. How do we do that? Well, we need to redirect our focus. We need to redirect our focus. Most of the times when we feel like hope is slipping away, it's because our focus is in the wrong place. We are focused on the wrong thing. We are focused on our circumstances. I'm not just preaching to you. I'm preaching it to myself as well because I find that I'm focusing on the wrong thing and I'm going, hope, 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 hope. But he's like, no, don't focus on hope just because of hope. Focus on Jesus. Focus on him. Don't focus on the temporal. Focus on the eternal. Focus on the nature and character. Focus on the one that doesn't change. And we need to redirect our focus when we feel like We are losing hope in our circumstances because there is hope. His name is Jesus. Isaiah 40 says, Lift up your eyes to the sky and see for yourself. Who do you think created the cosmos? He lit every shining star and formed every glowing galaxy and stationed them all where they belong. He has numbered, counted, and given each one a name. They shine because because God's incredible power and awesome might. Not one fails to appear. Why then, O Jacob's tribes? Why then, O Urban Life Church? Why then, insert your name there, would you ever complain? Why then, Urban Life, would you ever groan in despair? Why then, Urban Life, would you not have hope? Why then, son? Why then, Wanga? Why then, daughter, are you complaining? And my chosen Israel, why would you say Yahweh isn't paying attention to my situation? Why? Insert your name again. Would you say Yahweh isn't paying attention to my situation? He has lost all interest in what happens to me. Don't you know? Don't you know? Haven't you been listening? Yahweh is the one and only everlasting God. The creator of all you can see and imagine. He never gets weary or worn out. His intelligence is unlimited. He never puzzled over what to do. Come on, where is our focus? Who is the object of our faith? Who is the object of our hope? It's not things, it's not circumstances, it's not the promise of a job, it's not another person. The object of our faith is Jesus. If it is Jesus, then why then, oh Wanga, why then am I complaining? Why then am I groaning? Do I not know who God is? Hebrews 12, verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know why I love the picture of Jesus sitting down? Is that in our hopelessness, in our losing of things, especially me, I find myself just chucking things around. I'm opening the fridge. I'm even messing up my house because I'm throwing my clothes everywhere to find my keys. But Jesus is seated. 
He's seated on the throne. He doesn't move. He doesn't go, oh, no, 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 election is here today. What's going to go down? Oh, no, it's going to be a mess. No, he's still seated on the throne. So when we fix our eyes with it, on him, it doesn't change. He's not perplexed. He's not moved by what we are going through. It's been happening before creation. It's happening in creation. It will happen long before you and I are gone and with Jesus. But the truth of the matter is Jesus is seated on the throne because he has overcome death. He has resurrected to life. And because of that, we can have hope for our current circumstances. Let's fix our eyes on him, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Psalm 43, verse 5. Oh, I, my soul, are you downcast? Maybe you feel like that right now. Your soul is just downcast. Your soul is in despair. You are struggling to cope. Maybe you got to talk to your soul today. You see, what I love again, even the psalmist here is not denying the reality of the situation of what he's going through because hope does not live in denial. Hope recognizes what's happening. It recognizes reality. It recognizes circumstances, but we live with anticipation and expectation because we know who our God is. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in the Lord, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. One of the things I love is when I encounter people that are going through immense pain, where I'm like, you should be downcast, and I see them praising the Lord. It's something that you would never understand, that someone has lost someone they love or they're going through say, a tragic time, but they're still worshiping and praising, the God, praising God. Why? Because they've told their soul that their hope is in the Lord. And the pain they're feeling now is just temporary. So how are you coping? Are your eyes fixed on Jesus? Are you fixed on the temporary or on the eternal? See, hope is not just a way to cope. It's a way to live. Hope is not just a way to cope. It's a way to live. And God has a promise for us. And I really believe this is a promise for every single person in this room. So I'm going to ask us to stand. The band is going to come up. And we're going to step into hope like never before. Are you guys ready? So just stand up. Let's stand in the presence of God. If you touch your neighbor, say there's hope. His name is Jesus. <clears throat> We've been reading this promise for the last couple of weeks. Warren preached on this, and Brother Mesh did an incredible job uh, last week on this as well. So make sure you go online if you are not here, uh, where he was just vulnerable about his own story and what Jesus has been doing in his walk and his journey with God. So it's titled A Better Way, a, a Better Journey. A better Journey. But here's the promise. Isaiah 40, verse 29. 40, verse 29 to 31. It says he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Are you weary? Are you weak? See, God does not promise that you, you won't have things in your life that will take away your strength or that will make you feel weak. But what he does promise is strength. He says, he gives strength to the weary. He increases the power of the weak. It's in my weakness where he's made strong. Even youths grow weary. Even youths grow tired and weary. And young men stumble and fall. But those who, you are right. In other places it says wait. But remember, the word wait also means hope. In this translation, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. I'm going to read it one more time because I need you to get this. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. 
I want to tell you today, young men, young women, even myself, I consider myself active. But if I run for a long time, I will get tired. But when you have hope, it says even youths will grow tired and weary. It doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter what you have seen in this life. It doesn't matter what you have gone through. It doesn't matter if you are 80. When you have hope, you will outrun a young man. You will outrun a young woman. You will outrun the most active person you know. This is a metaphor for real life now. It doesn't matter what you've been through. And I want someone to hear that this morning. Youths will grow weary and tired. They will stumble and they will fall. And you know what it's like to fall. You know what it's like to get weary. You know what it's like to be in a place where you feel like you can't get up again. But you got up and you are here this morning. So you're in a good place to hear this. You can get up one more time. Again and again and again and again. Why? Why? Because you have hope. Because you have hope. And your hope isn't in a circumstance. Your hope isn't in things that change. Your hope is in the Lord. Your hope is in Jesus Christ. And because you have that, that hope comes with a promise. And look at what the promise says. It says that you will soar on wings like eagles. You will run and not grow weary. You will walk and not be faint. It's a beautiful promise for you. It's a beautiful promise for every single one of us. But we have to hope in the Lord. The promise comes with an instruction. Say, hope in me. Put my faith in you. Wait on me and see what I will do. And lastly, in the New Testament, we are introduced to a whole different kind of hope. If you thought it gets good, it gets better. <laughs> because this hope changes every single thing for every single one of us. And this is the hope that Peter describes in 1 Peter 1 verse 3. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. I want you to say that. Into a, into a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There's a living hope. Hope is not just something that we look back into. Now hope, because of what Jesus has done, friends, it has come alive and it now lives inside you. You have hope in you. When you said yes to Jesus, hope came alive inside of you. You can never lose it. You can always access it because it is there in you because Jesus has resurrected. We don't look back into the old, old, old. We look back into the resurrected King, Jesus Christ. Because He has resurrected, we have also resurrected with Him. What a beautiful truth. Now imagine that Jesus, the Christ that has overcome death and resurrected to life on your side. Why would you be downcast? Why would your soul be downcast? Why would you be hopeless? Why would you choose to live in despair? You have a Christ that's risen. You have a Jesus that is alive. That changes every single thing. We don't groan like the world. We don't groan like the world. We don't cope like the world. In fact, hope is not just a better way to cope anymore. Yes, it will help you cope, but it will do more than that. It will help you live. And it might seem crazy when you go to the elections and to the polls next week and you are smiling to someone who's wearing a different jersey than the, than the one you are wearing or the political party you represent. And they're like, is he crazy? You're like, no, my hope is not in my political party to win. My hope is in the resurrected Christ. And because he's alive, I know, I know, I know that I know that I know that I know that the story doesn't end in a current circumstance. I believe in the eternal. I believe in the resurrected one. I have resurrection life. No one can take that away from me. Businesses may fail. I will try again and I will stumble. I will fall over and over and over again. But I promise you, I will get up. I will have perseverance because my hope is in the resurrected life. It's in Jesus and that changes everything. If I were you right now, I'll start to give him praise and give him glory because he owns it and he deserves it. There's hope. There's hope. There's hope for the hopeless. And you might have arrived this morning in groaning. 
and your groaning is like of that of the world because you don't know Jesus and in this moment you've just realized that your faith and your hope was in the wrong object and you're going I want Jesus to be the object of my hope I want to put my faith in the Lord I want to trust in him with all my life I want to surrender my life to Jesus because he's the only way to live Jesus comes and says I'm the way the truth and the life it's only one life it's in Christ and today you can come into that life he could bring you alive with him it doesn't matter what you have done it doesn't matter where you've been if you've never put your life or given your faith into Jesus today is the day of salvation if that's you I'm gonna count up to three and I want you to say that's me I want to put my hope I want to put my faith in Jesus for the very first time one come on already Jesus loves you I want you to know that Jesus sees you he knows you he's for you two anyone else want to give their life to Jesus three today is the day of salvation if that's you just raise your hand right up high there's no shame there's no guilt you are loved beyond measure come on you're gonna take a moment alongside those that have given their life to Jesus to declare this hope that we are in and it's through a prayer and in faith I want you to join us as we declare where our faith is in and who our faith is in are you ready come on Jesus I believe that you are my Lord and Savior that you died for my sin you were raised from the dead I have resurrection life in you thank you for your free gift of salvation I am a new creation forgiven by grace through faith in you alone fill me with your Holy Spirit and empower me to do your will in your ways for your glory amen hi family uh, what a wonderful service we had today the word was amazing we had a lot of testimonies uh, we've got the rise conference coming up yeah. absolutely when do you think that is that will be on the 7th and 8th of june and you can get our uh, the tickets at our church app yeah our church center app yeah. absolutely and we'd love to see you yeah. there it's for the youth and the young adults yeah. so we definitely sending you 10,000 invites bring your friends bring your friends bring your friends friends we'd love to see you there yeah. we've got amazing things planned out trust me you don't want to miss it um, and obviously with our elections mm -hmm. coming up mm -hmm. we know the country is at a spot right now we're at a space where we're a bit wary we're groaning we're scared and we don't know and I just wanted to leave you with this encouragement that Wanga mentioned in our preach as well from Romans 15 verse 13 um, I pray that God the source of hope will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit um, wishing you guys an amazing week thank you so much for joining us today uh, we will see you next week same, same time, time same, same place. place but it's been great having you thank you for watching Bye. Bye.